Bob Rauber. Um, I've known Bob for many years. We go back to my years, my early years at CSU, back in the late 70s. Um, when Bob came from Penn State, he was originally an English major at Penn State, and in 78 he got a degree in physics. Degree in physics, and then he came to CSU, which is where I knew him. And um, so, in my time at CSU, he was there most of the time working with Lou Grant on cloud physics. And at CSU, <clears throat> Bob was the one that actually established the Storm Peak Laboratory that we've gone there. Some of you, uh, most of you don't remember, but we went up there in the wintertime uh, for a class up there. And uh, I think Grant has continued that on and, and Unker in the past couple of years. But um, Bob was the original person that established this before Randy Boris came in. And, and built more of a permanent structure, but you had the, the trailer up there for this. I was actually Randy. I mean, Randy, Randy <coughs> and I were both all together. He, okay. he gets a credit on me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, after you graduated with your PhD, what, around 82? 85. 85, okay. Yeah. Then you went on to, to work in Auburn, California in the cloud seeding business with a private company, but you actually worked with the Bureau. And um, you're still a little bit Still working seeing with cloud physics. Yeah, still seeing. We're not going to talk about that today. <laughs> <laughs> and then in uh, 1987, you went on to Illinois, where you became faculty there. And uh, we've seen each other at conferences and always hang out uh, for many years now. And um, as and he's been faculty at, at uh, Illinois for a long time, and he's been chair in the Department of Atmospheric Science there for 12 years. 12 years. Wow. Some kind of a record maybe. Now he's recently moved on to a director of the program on the school scale. And um, in the meantime, uh, he, he continues to do a lot of research. He does a field program about every other year or every year, practically. And um, so he's, he's uh, very active in research as well as the management of the program, which has blossomed into one of the largest programs in the country now since uh, you've, been, you've had the reins there. So, it's been uh, quite a rock. So I'll let you go okay. and Thanks, talk Brad. about your time. Mm. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me up here. Uh, my, my daughter is a badger. Uh, she got her degree in 2010. So I was driving up here a lot between 2006 and 2010. Uh, I've probably paid for a lot of the facilities here uh, with all the checks that I wrote out. I'm not pretty sure I did something. Uh, and uh, so I have a real strong connection to, to the University of Wisconsin, and it's one, wonderful to be able to come up and give you a talk. So today I'm going to talk about something called generating cells and elevated convection in winter storms. Uh, I really have to thank everyone else, uh, my colleagues, Greg McFarquhar, Brian Jewett, and that big long list of people are all the students who worked with me on various things you're going to see today, uh, who, uh, who really did all the work, and I was the cheerleader but the uh, cheerleader gets to give you the talk, and uh, my students really, really deserve a lot of credit for everything I'm going to show you today. All right, so what I want to do is I want to take you on a long journey. I'm going to start 37 years ago. 37 <coughs> years ago, I was a student at CSU, and uh, I was working on a project in Steamboat Springs studying cloud, uh, cloud seeding and cloud physics. Uh, this is me sitting on top of a radiometer. This, uh, they, these things are now big as a mailbox. Okay, but back in those days, they looked like this. You know, we were we lived in the Stone Age of equipment, mm -hmm. and uh, and and I, I so I did I did my dissertation, and one of the discoveries of my dissertation, this is actually figured out of my dissertation, it's in a, in a publication back in 1986. When you try to study cloud seeding, one of the important things you have to understand is where super cool water is present in clouds. I won't get into the details of this, but you know where super cool water is located. Okay, so we, that's what we spent our time trying to figure out. That's what I used that radiometer for. And I come up with this figure for shallow clouds and deep clouds and so on, and I'm not going to worry about telling you all the details of this. <coughs> what I really want you to see is that. You see, I've, I've, I've said there's some super cool water up at the tops of the clouds. This is temperatures of minus 20, minus, so we flew there to, through the tops of these clouds. We kept running into super cool water. Why would you have super cool water at the top of a cloud? That's crazy, 
right? But it was there. We saw it. We knew it was there. We, was, we had multiple measurements of this thing. And I thought, you know, at the time I was thinking to myself, man, I made the greatest discovery on the planet. You know, I mean, you know, when you do your PhD, you think, hey, I, I figured that out, you know? And then I submitted the paper. And this reviewer comes back and says, did you happen to look at the paper in 1951, published 66 years ago, by a guy named Cunningham? And he put this picture, right? And I went and looked at it. And here you see, this guy's got this picture of a winter cloud. This is in January. And he's got these funny looking things on here. He's kind of, I'm going to talk a lot about these later on. And if you look over in here, he's got a measure of liquid water content from an icing rate meter. Uh, so you've got these things, and right up in this corner, he's got super cool water at cloud. Man, you want to talk about deflating. <laughs> you're, you're, you know, there goes, you know, I was, I was like, I was walking around for like a day going, ooh, ooh, you know, and I was really like kind of getting. I, and then I got to thinking about it, and I thought, you know, I'd better look at this a little more carefully and see if anybody else has seen this thing. Well, it turns out the World War I pilots <coughs> flying over clouds, and how many of you have seen one of these? How many know what it is? Mm -hmm. Anybody know what the name of this is? The Glory, right? Yeah. The glory. Yeah. This is yeah. Glory. Right yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is cloud top. This is a shadow of a plane. There's Glory. Glory is a water drop phenomenon. These World War II pilots, they, they discovered this long ago. There's super cool water at cloud top. They see it all the time. Next time you fly, look down. If you can see the shadow of the plane, you'll see it too. Okay? It's a diffraction ring caused by liquid water. So then I got to thinking, well, this is 100 years ago, but now I'm thinking, man, I wonder if I have to go back further. <laughs> well, it, it turns out that there's a phenomenon called the Brocken spectra, named after the Brocken Mountain in Germany, that a Spanish got general of the Navy. This guy was an explorer. He was a great scientist back in his day. He also was a conquistador, and he went up on top of the Andes Mountains, and it was really cold out. It was so cold, when, and he had a cloud down below him. And he looked down at the cloud, and he saw the Brocken spectra around his head, and he wrote up what he saw, and he said in his journal that it must be caused by ice particles because it was much too cold for water to exist. It was really water. But, so uh, this was 250 years ago, but then I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. I wonder if there's anything worse than that, you know? Well, it turns out if you go 2,000 years ago, there's a phenomenon called Buddha's light. And there's records of, and Buddha's light is the Brocken spectra, and records of that actually go back at Mount Imai in China to 63 AD during the Han Dynasty in China. So my lesson to all you graduate students is this. If you think you discovered something, you better look back in time because somebody else probably saw it too. The folks in the 1950s, by the way, were just spectacular. They figured out everything. We just don't read their papers anymore. <laughs> okay, so let's go back to my question. So, so I, I think I've made the point that there are super cold water cloud top. Now the question is why? Why is there super cold water at the coldest part of the cloud? Okay, so. Back in 1993, I, I, I asked that question. I thought, let's figure this out. So we did some calculations. We published this, uh, and I'm just going to show you this. So here's a diagram. There's a lot of little numbers on there. So uh, this, this axis is the number of number uh, concentration of ice particles. It goes from 0 to 100. Uh, and then, so I want you to imagine a 1 meter cubed volume, OK? Uh, that uh, has a particular temperature and pressure. It's near the cloud top. It's up near the top of the cloud. And it contains n particles where n can go from 0 to 100. These are ice particles. Now let's suppose that volume of air is going up. Okay? It's got a vertical velocity. And the vertical velocity ranges from about 0.01 meters per second to 1 meter per second. Okay? So that's the scale right there. Now, if we wanted to calculate the, the condensate production rate in that volume of air. Let's suppose we could do one of two things. We could assume it's water saturated or we could assume it's ice saturated. If we wanted to calculate what that was, we could do that. I won't write the equation up here, but that, that condensation rate is not dependent on the number of ice crystals. Okay? That's just how much adiabatic production of water there is. And so it's going to have some value that depends on the vertical velocity. And I'll indicate that by that dashed line. Okay, now, we can also calculate how much the diffusional growth rate of ice is. So imagine that volume has a bunch of ice crystals in it. They're all growing. They're extracting water. 
while water's being produced as it goes up. Okay, now the question is, what would it take to bring it to, to, to water saturation and above water saturation so that liquid water would be produced? That was the question we asked. All right, so what W is required given a, uh, an ice part of concentration? We did two sets of calculations, one starting with a water saturated cloud, one starting with an ice saturated cloud. And these are all the results. Now, if you look at these lines, these five lines here represent different size distributions of particles. So these are small part or large particles. Uh, I'm sorry, very few, very few large particles. This is the size distribution with a lot of large particles. Okay? And uh, we did this for various temperatures and pressures. So we got five degree, minus five and 800 millibars, minus 15 and 600, minus 22 and 500. We're getting up top of the cloud, and minus 32 and 400. Okay, and Anytime you see a dash line above a solid line, that's where you're going to produce, you're going to take water, you're going to take that volume, and you're going to increase the relative humidity until it finally saturates. Okay, so, so the trick here is understanding one very important aspect of cloud talk. And cloud talk is where, by nature, <coughs> ice particles have got to be small. Right? I mean, they start there, right? You know, when you were born, you started little, and then you got bigger because you ate a lot of stuff, okay? But ice particles are the same way. They have to grow from a small particle when they get bigger. So particles are small up there. And this is actually a picture of what we showed. These are ice particles right at the top, and then as you come down, they get bigger and bigger. Okay? These are images of ice particles from, a, from an optical array probe. And, and you can see that they're small here, and they grow as they come down. Okay, so, our, so we concluded that uh, we found that depending on the concentration and temperature, you can produce super cool water in a moderate, let's say 0.1 to 1 meter per second updraft near cloud top because the ice particles there are small. Okay, so what causes these updrafts? You know, in stratiform clouds, why would we get these strong updrafts near cloud top? And that's what my talk here is about. Okay, so that's, that's really the introduction to what I want to talk about today. And these are what I'm going to call cloud top generating cells. So this was all kind of driven by my interest in the super cool water at cloud top. So let's learn about cloud top generating cells. Now I want to show you a picture. This is a uh, radar composite of a very weak cyclone that happened to move across uh, Indiana here uh, in 2010. Now, we had at this point right here a vertically pointing X-band radar. Okay, this is actually Kevin Nupp's radar from uh, from the uh, University of Alabama. It's pointing vertically. And what I want to do is I want to show you some data for that. So this storm moved over this. We're mainly going to be looking at data in here as the storm passed over. All right. So take a look over here. What I want you to see, first of all, on the top panel, what you're looking at is a time section of radar reflectivity. Okay, this goes up to about seven kilometers up in here. Uh, and this is a, a panel that shows the vertical radial velocity. So this is how fast the particles in the volume are moving up or down, okay, because the radar sees the particles. Now, what do we see? Well, anywhere where you see hot colors, the particles are moving up which means you must have an updraft because you're carrying, carrying the particles up, right? Look at the cloud top. It's nuts. Look in here. You see all those updrafts in here, very thin updrafts, one after another, one after another, stronger over here, weaker back in there. Look at the tops. You've got all these things up there, right? What on earth is this? Look at what's happening. Out of every single one of these, there's plumes of ice particles coming out. Amazing, really, when you think about it. So what's going on at the cloud top? The cloud top is boiling. All right, I'm going to ask you all a question. How many of you have flown an airplane? When you descend, say you're flying up at, up at 33,000 feet, you start coming down, and there's a cloud below you. What happens when you enter the cloud? Yeah, they're both. Turbulence, right? All the time. You hit the cloud, boom, 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 boom. you know, you start bouncing around. If you descend a little bit further into the cloud, 
then it settles down. This is what you're going through. You're flying through these guys. You're flying through these turbulent, you're flying through these, these things I'm calling generating cells. Okay. All right, so there they are. All right, so is this a new discovery? No. Remember that uh, guy in 1951? Well, there's another guy in 1952 named John Marshall who was the first person to point a radar up through a winter storm. And he published a paper, Precipitation Trajectories and Patterns, and showed these things in a very crude radar, but certainly saw them before. In fact, in the 50s, there's a whole bunch of papers about these generating cells. They couldn't see the detail that we see. They didn't have the Doppler to be able to see the vertical velocities. But these have been around for a while, and, and, and people noticed them. When people forgot about these is when we started using scanning radars. Because scanning radars don't have the resolution to be able to see this stuff, and it washes all the socks. We're usually looking at the lower altitudes. And so we kind of conveniently forgot everything they learned back in the 50s. But they did publish papers on this. OK, so then the question is, so what's new? OK, what's new? And the new thing that we find is they are everywhere. Uh, this is a cyclone here. Uh, that we flew across. This, by the way, we're flying. I, I, I keep saying we're flying across. I should explain. We did a project back in 2010 called the Profiling a Winter Storms Project, where we flew the C-130 with the W-band radar, with the W-band radar pointing up and down, so we get a vertical profile of the, <coughs> of the clouds. W-band is very sensitive to small ice particles. It can see, uh, and and the, the radar has a resolution of about 10 meters. Okay, so. Uh, a resolution volume would get two volumes in the size of this room, okay, as opposed to uh, a scanning radar, which would be like you know a kilometer or so. So we can see very fine scale circulation. So we flew this radar on the on the C-130 aircraft across these cyclones, and I did, I'm going to just show you over here. This is this is just some examples from this flight. You can see these features up in here, okay, and up in here. Uh, and depending on which way you fly relative to the shear, you can see these streamers coming down and entering the cloud. You see these all get all the way down there. The, the, we, we saw these in almost every cyclone we flew through. And it, 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 you know, it was just astounding because when you look at this, you ask yourself, where's the snow coming from in a winter storm? This is where it's coming from. It's all coming from these guys up in here. This is the snow generation room. This is where the ice is forming. I'll show you some evidence for that in a few minutes. Now, is this just a point? Is this just cyclones? Well, I've done some other projects. Last winter, last winter we were doing a cloud seeding project out in Idaho. We were flying across the same radar. We were flying this across storms along mountains. Take a look at this. Now you got to stare at this a little bit. I don't know if you can see it from back there. But if you look at this cloud, this is just an orographic cloud. Here's the mountains here. If you look at the top, you can see there's streamers coming out of every single little part here, one after another. What if they're all merging down here into this area down in here? Okay. And if you look at the top, you can see in here that there are vertical motions. It's kind of hard to see at this scale, but there are little red areas, and red is up. There's little updrafts and downdrafts. You can actually see the turbulence in, in the way this vertical or gradual velocity looks in here. You know? So, so uh, this, is, this is in an orographic cloud over the mountains of the western United States. We see generating cells. We've seen them in the cyclones. Two years ago, actually two winters ago? No, last winter. Last winter. It was two winters ago, I was out in Idaho doing this. Last winter, I was flying out over the Southern Ocean using the, uh, the uh, NCAR G5 hyperclad radar, which is the same type of radar. This is a picture from, from it, uh, flying out, and we flew down over this area down in here. Oops, and that died. I did did I your computer maybe the, it went to sleep? There it uh, is. Password required, it wants a password. No, <laughs> you're back. You're good. <laughs> It says I have critical updates. I'm not I do not that. do those now, yeah. <laughs> okay. Fix apps that just are cancel. Blurry, cancel. It just Thank you, Mr. Gates. It's sabotage. Yeah. But the generating cell gods are, you know. <laughs> so um, this is over the Southern Ocean down here. 
And you know, I've indicated these, but you can see these little streamers coming down. Okay, and um, we'd see these down there, and these little <coughs> green areas up here are updrafts. So these things are ubiquitous. Okay, so what's going on? Uh, let me show you what they look like when you get a one-to-one. -one. So what we did is we took some of the data from the files program and we, we said let's plot it so that the horizontal scale is the same as the vertical scale. So we can now see what these actually look like if, if we were looking at them with your eye. You know, because one of the things we do in, in atmospheric science, a big mistake we make is we always have, you know, we always have a thousand kilometers this way and ten that way. So everything looks like it's skinny and tall. Okay, but if you spread them out and actually look the way they look like, this is what they look like. And you can see these convective cells up here. And if you come up, this is the vertical radial velocity from the radar. And you see reds, and they go from yellows to reds and so on. Two to three meter per second, one to three meter per second updrafts at the cloud top. This is in otherwise stratiform clouds. Okay, but, and this is where the snow is falling out. So uh, if we, uh, let me step back for a second and uh, say, okay, now what I want to do is I want to show you a, a diagram called a CFAN, a consular frequency by altitude diagram. Let me explain how this is constructed or else the diagram will be meaningless to you. Okay. Let's suppose that I, I come over to this radial velocity field and at four kilometers I do a distribution of vertical velocities across here. And so I just do a, you know, like a Gaussian distribution, whatever, a distribution of what they look like. Now suppose I do it at 4.5 kilometers and 4.8 kilometers. I get all those distributions and then I pile them up. That's what this diagram is, okay? What you're looking at, this is vertical velocity, or vert I should vertical radial velocity on this scale here. This is altitude. And this is a district, at any given level, this is a distribution of the occurrence of that particular value. So, for example, you see that red says that about 30% of the data was at about 0.8, minus 0.8 meters per second. <coughs> and if you look down in this area here, you can see that these they kind of don't change much through here. Okay, This is a cloud that's 10 kilometers deep. Through this region in here, you don't see much change. Uh, which means that the particles that are falling are falling at about the same speed at every level. And their average speed, or their modal speed, is about minus 0.8 meters per second, which is just about the terminal velocity of ice particles uh, in, in, in still air. Particles are just falling down, but if you look at the top up here, you see this Greek pillar, right? The velocities over here get up to about one and a half meters per second. These are radial velocities, so you have to add another meter per second or so, about one to three meters per second. There's also downdrafts up in here. Okay, so you see updrafts and downdrafts. And this is the generating cell level. This is where the particles are falling. These are major winter storms we're looking at here. Okay, these produced about you know, 10, 12 inches of snow, both of these. And in fact, this one in Iowa produced them 16. Okay, so these are major winter storms. Up in here is where all the snow is being generated, and then it's falling down. So these measurements, when you look at from a statistical point of view, show that the updrafts are about one to two meters per second in the core, sometimes getting up to three in the, in the generating cells. We also uh, did a, a FOIA analysis of these to try to see if we could get some idea of their size. Uh, and this is, just, uh, this is just an example of that. Most of the data lies at about one to two kilometers. In other words, their widths of these, these convective updrafts at the cloud top are about one to two kilometers. Okay, they're not that big, but that's where they are. All right, now, uh, fortunately, we did some pretty cool studies where we also got a chance to study the microphysics of these things. So uh, this is an example where we flew through, we had, to, uh, we had a cloud that there was a frontal boundary in here, you can see, it was a deep cloud over here and a shallow cloud over here. There were generating cells on the shallow cloud. There were generating cells on the deep cloud. And what we did is we flew back and forth across this. So we were flying this way, then that way, this way, and that way. Back and forth all the way down into this area down in here. Here's an example of a flight where we went through one of these generating cells, or uh, through a bunch of these generating cells here. This is in the upper part of the top. And then this is later on when we flew through the bottom one. And you can see all these streamers coming down out of these little cells right in here. We were able, over the entire project, 
to sample these things from about minus 30 degrees all the way down to about minus 12, okay, and, and uh, try to look at their microphysical structure. So let me show you some of the characteristics. If we look over here, uh, these are images that we took at the same altitude within the cells, and you can see that the ice particles there, these are shadows of ice particles from the optical array probes, are fairly large. Down in here, these are outside of the generating cells, and you can see that the particles are a <coughs> bit smaller. Okay, so this is typical where we see a lot more growth in the generating cells. In fact, uh, as I'll, I'll tell you a little bit later on, we did calculations of this. We actually calculated that the supersaturation in these generating cells could get up as high as maybe 30, 35% with respect to ice. That's incredible. These ice crystals just go, they blow up, uh, they grow so fast, it's just like, uh, like cannonballs going off. They, they grow really fast. And then I'd take them long to get the full precipitation size. All right, so the other thing we did was we did the statistics of all the data. Uh, this is, I know statistics is boring, but let me show you. Uh, so that we, we grouped the data into five categories, uh, from uh, the center at minus 11, center at minus 21, this is temperature, plus or minus five degrees around those temperatures up to minus 51. And then we looked at the generating cells versus outside the generating cells. The blue lines you see are inside the generating cells, the red lines are outside the generating cells. And we looked at a bunch of parameters. So this top panel you see here is the radar reflectivity from the W band. And if you look at the blue, you can see it's much higher. The modal value, by the way, is the, is the line in the middle of the blue, and these are the 25th and 75th percentiles. See the blue is, is much further to the right than the red. That's because there's higher reflectivity in it. Okay, and uh, this is particle concentration. You can see that the particle concentrations are much higher in the generating cells. Ice water content is significantly higher in the generating cells. And median particle dimension is higher in the generating cells. So basically, this, all these statistics just confirm what this little picture showing, that these generating cells produce more ice, bigger ice, and, uh, and as a result, produce higher reflectivity and higher ice water content. Yep. That's what we see. All right. Now, here goes back to my, remember at the very beginning of the talk, I was talking about super cool water clouds? Uh, I'm back, okay? So now, now comes the stuff I really, I really get excited about. Which is because I'm trying to, still trying to prove my thesis. So you got this. I mean, this is this is now. You know, I'm still doing this 30 years later. You know, you know was my thesis right? You got to think that. Up. Right. So this is a measure of the super cool water. We got two different probes here. One, the blue one and the red one are just different probes. Look at this. This is a cloud top. Warm clouds. We see liquid water contents up to about 0.3.4 grams per meter cube. Minus 20 to minus 25. There's super cool water up there. We saw super cool water at minus 32 degrees at the top of these clouds. That may not excite you, but man, I just I just run around like a chicken when I see this stuff. That, that, that's impossible, you know? I mean, you, you talk to one of these thermodynamics guys, talk about equilibrium thermodynamics, <laughs> he'll throw you out the door if you say something like that. That can't be, but it is. And when you get super cool water at the top of these clouds, you turn on all the ice nucleation mechanisms we know about. If you don't have super cool water, you can only nucleate ice by direct diffusion to the ice nuclei. But once you have water, you have contact nucleation, condensation freezing nucleation, all the nucleation mechanisms turn on. And believe me, when you turn ice nucleation at minus 25 or minus 30, it goes boom. It goes boom. I mean, it just, and ice forms. Okay? And this is why you get this ice pouring out of these generating cells. Because the water can form up there. And it can form because the ice particles initially are small enough that the updraft can drive it to above water saturation. This is actually the statistics of that. Okay, so, so if you look at the, the warmer temperatures, like minus 10 plus or minus 2.5, you find that the, the way to read this is that 80% of the clouds have greater than 0.05. I'm happy to invert these numbers. 20% of the clouds have greater than 0.2 grams per meter cube. You can see as you get colder, less and less of the cloud has super cool water, which you would expect. It's only in the updrafts we find it then, in the core of the updrafts, and not everywhere. So, so but, uh, but, but anyway, this is, this is amazing. I mean, it, the, because this is telling us where the snow is coming from. Okay. Now, the other thing we did is, uh, 
Okay, well, I'm going to come back to that. The other thing we did is we looked at the ice particle concentrations below the generating cell level, okay, and said, do they change? And the answer is, they do, but they don't get larger, they actually get smaller. So what's happening? What's happening is ice particles are falling or aggregating together. Once they, collect, once they collect each other, we call that one particle. Okay, so if you've got 10 up here and they start collecting each other, then you've got 9, you've got 8, you've got 7, right? That's actually the behavior we saw. The particles are growing because there's a moisture supply there, but they're not nucleating anymore. They were only nucleating at the top. That's amazing. I mean, uh, you know, if, if you're a cloud microphysics person, you should be scratching your head right now because it's not what we were taught in school, right? Okay, but that's what's happening. That's what, that's, that's, that's what the state is showing us. All right, so we asked the question. Now, I still haven't answered the question. Why are they there? Okay, why are these cells there? Uh, what's so unique about the cloud talk? What, what, makes, what makes this go? Okay, so we had a hypothesis. Our hypothesis was the generating cells are primarily forced by cloud top radiative cooling. Okay, and that their strength and organization is modulated by ambient conditional instability and vertical wind shear. This is our hypothesis. So, when you have a hypothesis, there's one other thing you need. Anybody know what it is? Data. No. You need a PhD student to figure it out. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, 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 I turned to my student and I said, "Figure it out." He did. Okay. So he said, "Okay, let's set up a series of modeling experiments. Uh, what, number one, what we'll do is we'll perform an idealized WARF LES simulation of the generating cells uh, using the cloud top thermal instability conditions corresponding." the conditions that we observed on the night where these were present. Okay? Then uh, modulate the radiative forcing for that case, so we have night, meaning no sunlight, mm -hmm. day, meaning both radiative cooling and infrared, I mean, and solar heating, and then no radiation at all, we just turn it off. Okay? And see what happens. Okay? So that was number one. See if they have the observed characteristics. See if the generating cells form and have the characteristics we observed. Okay. That paper is now published. Uh, Jason Keeler, my student, did this, and he published this in 2016. I'm going to show you the results. Okay. The second thing we said, okay, if this works, then what we'll do is we'll run a series of idealized simulations, and we'll vary the stability of the cloud top layer and radiative forcing to see the impact of what the ambient stability is. Okay. Now he's got that published now, too, and I'll show you those results. And finally, we'll run an additional series of simulations varying the shear stability in the cloud top layer to see what the role of shear is. And that's done too, so now Jason can go off and get a job. And he actually did, he's, he's, he's a professor now. So, uh, but, but this was his problem. And, then, and so I'm gonna show you his results. Okay, so uh, what we're gonna do is look at the net diabetic heating at top cloud top first. Okay, this is a net diabetic heating. Okay, so what I'm gonna show you here, there's, there's, we, we have radiative cooling, this is nighttime simulation, so we have radiative cooling in this simulation, and the top one here. Okay. In the bottom one, we have radiative cooling and shortwave heating. Okay, and then also there's latent heat release when these things convert to ice, right? So there's latent heat. So we look at the latent heating and the, the three effects. This is on this axis is time, okay, into the simulation. And this is just at the high altitudes. We're up at the generating cell level. And all these lines here are, uh, the, these are the percentiles of vertical motion that we <coughs> observed. So the median was zero, or was zero here. And then this is the, the, the distance above the line is the magnitude of the updraft. So uh, in this case, we had an initially unstable air. So it destabilized and it restabilized and then it destabilized again as radiative cooling continued to overturn the cloud. Okay, and you can see that the cooling is at the top and the heating is at the bottom. If you heat something at the bottom and cool it at the top, it gets unstable, right? Radiative cooling is the driver. If you turn on the sun, which is what we did here, all of a sudden the cooling becomes much less, heating becomes a little more, but nevertheless, you're still cooling overheating, and it can still destabilize, but not as much if you have 
uh, if you have the uh, sorry, it, it will destabilize if uh, you know if you have uh, both both uh, radiative cooling and, and heating because the net effect is radiative cooling. Okay, so in both those cases, we got generating cells. Uh, I'll just jump ahead here. I'll get all the detail there. And here's what they look like. So this is in the simulation. This is 45 minutes in. This is when we get into this area. And then they kind of settle down, and then they start up again. Here you can see the streamers coming off them as well. Okay, so this is this is a vertical profile now. This is height here, height here, height there. And these are three different times in the simulation. And that effect was when we simulated it, we could show that the size was the same as we observed, the magnitude of the updrafts were the same as we observed, the ice water contents were the same as we observed, it actually fit extremely well. Uh, now I made it sound like you ran one model run and all that you know, it took a while to get there, okay, but, but, but they matched. So that gave us confidence that we could move forward, okay. And so now what I'm going to show you is the results of 144 simulations. So everybody sit back in your chair. I'm, I'm going to do all 144. Uh, I actually am. You think I'm kidding? All right. The three radiation conditions. Radi nighttime, daytime, no radiation. Eight stability profiles and six shear profiles. The domain was 50 kilometers by 50, kilo 50 kilometers by 15 kilometers with 100 meter grid resolution. This is what we did. This is the original sonding from that case. We modified it a little bit to get rid of this little bump and just made it stable here. And then in this area here, which was the cloud top, we varied the stability. This is theta E we're looking at on this diagram here. And so we made an unstable layer, a less than unstable layer, a less unstable layer, and a neutral layer, and then stable layer. So we varied the stability in the cloud top region. Then we had shear profiles. Uh, we made it the no shear down below, and then we uh, caused, we had the shear no shear, and then more shear, more shear through the through the uh, generating cell layer. Okay, so those are all the initial conditions. All right, here's the 144 simulations. Now, first thing I want you to do is don't look at the numbers, okay? Because if you look at the numbers, it'll take you three years to read through this table. Okay, let me just explain how this works. Stability goes in this direction. This is initially the most unstable case, this is the most stable case, this is the neutral case in here. There are four panels for each case. This is 60 minutes into the simulation, 120, 180, and then the max vertical velocity. Shear goes in this direction for each group. Okay, so this is uh, no shear, more shear, no shear, more shear, no shear, more shear. This is nighttime, this is daytime, and this is no radiation. What I want you to look at is the colors, not the numbers, okay? So just look at these colors. There's only five colors, so that makes it a little bit easier. Uh, and just think to yourself, boy, if I see this dark blue, we got really strong generating cells in this light blue. If I see this green, it's kind of strong still. If I see this, see this thing here, and eh, there are no generating cells, okay? So we'll just think of it. Now, let's start over here, okay? This is the initially uns most unstable case at nighttime. This is the one we really expect to go because it's radiative cooling like mad and it's most unstable. And, and you can see that we get our blue right in there. We get max and we get dark, the dark greens. Then you get generating cells all the time at night. Now, I, I should mention, when I came over here, uh, I, I, I met with uh, Lee and Marsha, uh, and Marsha works over, uh, Lee's wife works over at the weather service. And, and she said, well, that makes sense. It always snows harder at night. I, I, <laughs> Amen. Yeah, okay. Uh, hallelujah. You know, so there it is. Okay, uh, she's, uh, the weather service knows it's not. Okay, let's move down here. This is an initially neutral case. <coughs> You notice at the very beginning of the simulation, no generating cells, but radiative cooling kicks in, and by the end of the simulation, we're getting just as small, almost as strong as we got before. Okay? You come down here to the most stable case, now it takes longer, but we still get generating cells. It just takes a while for radiative cooling to erode the initial stability, okay? but it eventually happens. Let's jump over to daytime. Okay? Daytime, now we're reducing the magnitude of the cooling, but you still get generating cells. If you go, and it, when, when the air is initially unstable, when it's initially neutral, uh, it takes a while longer, we still get them, but they're not quite as strong, 
And when the air is very stable, it's hard for radiative cooling to counteract it. You really have a hard time getting the generating cells rolling. If you turn off radiation, if the air is unstable, you get them. But in a lot of cases, as you get there, not, not much shear over here, you don't get them. And then when you get down here, you really need a lot of shear to kick these off. And finally, if it's stable, you just don't get any. Okay? So, so the net result of all this is that, um, it, it, to try to summarize it, that stability affects it. But if it's nighttime, you can even initially, in initially stable cases, you can force these generating cells. In the daytime, it's harder, particularly if the air is stable. But if it's neutral or unstable, you can do OK. And if there's uh, and and if there's no radiation, you know it's it's just no forcing. If it's unstable, you'll get some. If it isn't, you won't. Okay. Now I want to talk a little more about the effects of shear. But okay. I want to ask. Yeah. What is what's the critical threshold that's being reached to cause nucleation? Is it supersaturation? Okay. Nucleation of ice. Yeah. Uh, it's it's hard to say what the threshold is. I mean, I don't have a good measure of, of that. I can tell you that the uh, supersaturations, you, you know, if you think about the supersaturation curve mm -hmm. relative to water and ice, okay, uh, when it, you basically get about one degree of uh, one percent supersaturation for every degree cold, right? So at, at, at five degrees uh, at water saturation, you're 105 percent with respect to ice. Well, how are you parameterizing nucleation here? We aren't. It's just, uh, you mean in here? It was, yeah. uh, we're using Thompson microphysics in this thing. I mean, it's just basically Thompson microphysics in, in the model. So, so, they're, so they're using, I think you're using a um, nucleation that's based on saturation. That's based on saturation, that's right. That's yeah, right. Thompson does that, uh, yes. but uh, Morrison one doesn't. So we, we chose Thompson because it, it, the numbers made sense when we compared it to the real data, which is what we were after. So we, we actually looked at a couple of different microphysical parameterizations, but the Thompson parameterization actually produced the, the correct values, or close to correct values for what we saw. So that's that's the microphysical parameterization. Mm -hmm. oh. Sorry, I didn't understand your question. All right, uh, I want to look a little bit at what shear does. Okay, so now what we're looking at is a, slight, a horizontal slice through the simulation. And uh, what you're looking at here is the unstable case, the neutral case, the stable case. No shear, 4 meters per second per kilometer shear, 10 meters per second per kilometer shear. Uh, and this is nighttime, daytime, and no radiation. If you look over here, you can see that in each of these cases, whether it's nighttime, daytime, or the unstable, no radiation case, you see that the cells are open, they're like open cell convection. Okay, they're, 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 they're set like no open cell convection. Mm -hmm. But if you add shear, oops, actually that's, that's true for a matter, if you look down this way, you can see that even in the stable nighttime case, it still has the same structure, just not as strong in terms of the reflectivity. Or this is actually looking at the precipitation mixing ratio. Okay, if we look across, you can see what happens. The cells line up, much like you see in boundary layer rolls or anything like that, and they become linear like this. Okay, so if there's shear up there, uh, you're going to see these things tend to line up. If there's not, they tend to form more open cell convection. Uh, the same is true in the neutral case. It's just not as, not as, as strong. And in uh, and, and daytime radiation as well, you can see that linear type structure when you add the shear, but none in here. Uh, and then when you get over in here, when there's no radiation, uh, it really, there's not a heck of a lot going on here because uh, the cells are hard to even identify. Bob? Yeah. Is the density of high reflectivity the same in each of those squares as you go across in the shear? Or do you, you're not only changing the organization, you're changing something about the density of intensity, aren't you? Uh, you are, and uh, we didn't calculate that, okay. so I don't know the answer to that. Okay, so what do we learn about generating cells? Uh, uh, Number one, that the, the model of generating cells closely match the observed generating cells in vertical velocity, horizontal and vertical dimensions, and mixing ratio. The fall strengths behave similar to those we saw on the radar. Generating cells develop in the presence of cloud top potential instability and persist when radiative forcing is present. Under neutral or even stable cloud top conditions, radiative forcing will destabilize the cloud top and generating cells will develop. Uh, this result provides a physical explanation for the ubiquity of these cells. Generating cells consist of stronger updrafts and higher price precipitation mixing ratios at night 
when destabilization due to longwave cooling is not offset by shortwave warming, they don't develop in the absence of radiative forcing unless cloud top potential instability exists. No shear when radiative forcing is present, cloud top convection organizes closed cells, closed convective cells, and when there was shear, they organize as linear streets parallel to the shear. All right, so I still have how many more minutes? Perfect. Okay, I have one more thing I want to tell you about, and that's elevated convection in the comet. Now, what I just showed you was elevated convection. But now we're going to switch gears. I'm going to talk about a different elevated convection. Okay, uh, and we're going to be looking at some strong cyclones. We're going to be, and uh, so, okay, so uh, during plows, what we did is we. This is this is a piece of the comet head. So if you think here's the comet head here. We flew across here, and this is a radar depiction, got some bands in here and so on, of that part. This is snowing, snowing like crazy in here, okay? Uh, we had a profilers uh, in these locations here. We launched some regulance ons and stuff. Not gonna have time to show you all that. I also managed to convince NSF to let me fly one time over a nor'easter uh, with the hypercloud radar. I can't get into the story that it takes me 10 minutes, I'll use all my time. But I managed to pull this off, and we did one flight over an oyster. Okay, we flew over this storm along this path. This produced about 12 inches of snow in Boston during the time we were flying. We flew back and forth along a straight line. I want to show you data from the nor'easter flight. I want to show you data from this flight here, where we flew across here. All right. So let's look at the common reflectivity structures that we saw in both those storms. Again, we're using that W band vertically pointing radar. So here it is, okay, this is the south side, this is the north side, okay, and this is the nor'easter, this is the south side, this is the north side, okay, this is a storm much like the ones that hit us in the winter here in Wisconsin, uh, this is a storm that went over Boston. Both of these storms produced about, uh, somewhere on the order of about 16 inches of snow in various areas, okay. What I want you to look at is this area right here, what on earth is that? I mean, these powers of reflectivity, right? If you look here, same thing, southern half of the storm, powers of reflectivity. You know, on the north side, it's more uniform, and you have generating cells at the cloud top, right? And same thing over here. Although the generating cells are not quite as strong, I note that this flight was at night, this flight was in the day. All right, so let's try to look closely at these cycles. And I want you to look right in this area here. Now, this is hard to see because it's a sear shield up here. But oftentimes, if you look right in the comma head up in here, you'll see this corrugated look to it. I bet we can see it better now with go, you know, these two ghost satellites. You look in there, and you will see elevated convection. Now, why do I say it's elevated? All right, this is that same data I just showed you from Klaus. Except what I've done now is we, we ran a, a, uh, a warp simulation of the storm, just initializing it just, just a couple hours before. So, and then we, then we took the data, we overlaid, a, we took a cross section along the aircraft path and overlaid it on there. It's not a perfect match, but it gives us an idea of what the thermodynamics were. Okay, this is what it looks like. Here's a front. Okay, you can see this is all, this is, by the way, we're looking at the theta E field here. There's a D, there's a Arctic front down here. There's a, there's a, frontal boundary here, and then you can see it's more less stable up in this region up in here. I'll give you a close-up of that in a minute. Okay, but when you look at this, you can see that the, clearly uh, nothing down here is convective, right? I mean, you know, this is stable as a rock. Okay, so if we're going to have any convection, it's going to have to occur up in this area up in here. So let me blow that up again. This is the picture I just showed you. All I did here, by the way, is I, I just turned it around. So I put south on this side now it's the same picture except I've got south on that side. Okay, so this is the southern side. That's what I'm going to call the convective region. I'm going to blow this up a little more and I'm going to show you some stuff that goes on there. Okay, this is, a, this is an example of one of these turrets. Now, again, what you're looking at here is the, uh, the reflectivity field. This is the radial velocity field. And I've overlaid on this uh, the theta E field. And one thing you can see here is, is this is a new convective tower going up. We've got velocities in here, five, six meters per second 
in, in the towers in here. Okay, over here, this is an old cell. It's been there for a while. It's snowing itself out. It's starting to get to weaken and snow's just coming up and falling out of this thing. Okay, but right in here, we've got these strong vertical velocities. When we overlaid the model data, we saw that there was an unstable layer right in here. We did this with both the nor'easter data and with southern data, and we could find these, these potentially unstable layers uh, that were triggering this, this convection. All right, so what does this have to do with anything? Well, I don't know how many of you have ever seen Jim Cantori uh, go crazy on the Weather Channel whenever there's thunder snow, but, uh, but thunder snow is something that everybody's been interested, you know, these, uh, these electrical storms when you have uh, when you have snow. Well, fortunately, uh, when these things went over our, our site, we happened to have a field mill that measures the electric field. Uh, and we had it on, you know, right, right by us. And, um, and this, this is a vertical profiler now. This is, the, this is the vertical radial velocity. So you can see there's like four to six meter per second updrafts in these towers here. Don't ignore this one. Here's the towers right there, okay? And when you look at the electric field, you can see the electric field is kind of going crazy on the surface. That means that there's charging going on above us. Just so you understand the difference between that and a stratiform storm, here's when, that, the, when the northern stratiform part went over. Uh, you can see that the electric field, these little oscillations are just instrumental. Uh, there's nothing going on, right? So these things are actually charging. So the question then becomes, why are they charging, okay? Well, let's think about it. You got six meter, per, we flew through these things. I can tell you there were six meter per second updrafts. We, we, you know, we, we, we measured these things, they're there. Okay, so we got six meter per second updrafts. And this is, this is a, 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 fine, a fine scale example. This is the 314, 313, 312, 311 theta E contour. Uh, this is, this is con, you know, this is, these are layers, so this is potentially unstable layer. Uh, in here, and, and convective, convective circulations are triggering. But because we got lucky and we flew through these things, we were able to get our microphysics. And I had a wonderful undergraduate student who analyzed all the microphysics in these things and actually published the first author <coughs> paper in jazz. It's Amanda Murphy, she's now at Oklahoma, getting her PhD degree. But uh, Amanda did this analysis, and, and she showed pretty conclusively that when we flew through these things and saw these updrafts, that we had grapple in the presence of super cold water. This is the liquid water through a pass in the cloud. This is grapple particles. <coughs> if you have grapple liquid water in the range of zero to minus 10 with a six meter per second updraft, you're right on the threshold of charging sufficiently to produce lightning. Not quite. Almost there. Okay. So what else do you need? Well, it turns out one of my colleagues, who I didn't know about, had done a separate study of this storm, and what they had done was they were looking at where the lightning struck, and they found out that the lightning was striking towers all the time. It was the only thing, the only lightning hit hit the towers all the time, either buildings or towers. It was things that stuck up, right? And so they were coming up with a theory of why stratiform clouds. Produce light, why poles produce lightning in stratiform clouds, and I showed this at the radar conference, and I said, I don't think they're stratiform clouds, I think they're, they're, they're stratiform on the bottom, but they're convective on the top. And, uh, and so, you know, we worked it out between us that, yeah, okay, we've got this convection, it's right on the threshold, wintertime convection, right on the threshold of producing uh, elect electrical discharges, and, and then you give it something to discharge on by putting a stick of pole up in the air, and, uh, and boom, you get you get the, the lightning, and so this is this is how thunder thunder snow occurs. This is this is essentially these things are up there. You can't see them, okay? But this convection is elevated. It's up there, and it's got the right characteristics for inductive charging, and that's what you need for that's what you need for thunder snow, okay? And uh, you can see this. Uh, this is an unstable layer in the nor'easter cloud. Now this didn't produce any lightning, but uh, but I can guarantee you these things are probably probably discharging. Down here, all this is just falling snow. This is where the instability lies, up in here, in this area right there. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'll skip this. We did a lot of trajectory work on where this air comes from. Uh, I, won't, I won't get into that. So let me just summarize what we learned about elevated convection. Uh, 
what we find is an upper, upper troposphere dryer, and I mean by dry, I mean not saturated, okay? It's, it's not dry like desert, okay? But it's unsaturated air, comes up over top of this moist layer, okay? That's, and, and the upper upper level air has a low theta e, lower theta e value, convection starts to trigger in you. That convection goes up sometimes to the tropopause. We get these convective cells that go up at about, I mean, the cape is maybe 50, 100, 200 joules per kilogram. They go up at about five, six meters per second tops, but they do get to the point where they can charge. Okay? Uh, the northern zone is deep stratiform clouds topped by cloud top generating cells. Uh, and they produce plumes of snow, but they don't, they don't uh, produce any charging. Okay? The southern zone has this potentially unstable layer. Not in all cyclones, but some of them. Uh, and we see elevated convection. Lightning, when it occurs, originates from the elevated convection in the southern zone. And the trajectory analysis we did, which I wish I could give a whole other talk on this, uh, showed that the air that gets into this region undergoes so many diabetic processes along the way that you can't just say follow an isentrope into that area and, and did something. Uh, the trajectories we looked at were anything but isentropic. Everything happened. We had radiative cooling and uh, mixing over mountains, all kinds of things that made the uh, that made the interpretation very complicated. It's a paper out by my student, uh, Andrew Ross now, you can look at that if you want to understand it. So anyway, thanks for inviting me. It was fun. I hope you learned something. So one of the earliest slides that you showed, which I think was based on the work that was done a long time ago, showed <laughs> The super cool water, not just at the top of the clouds, but also on the margins of the clouds, yeah. uh, if I remember right. And and what came to my mind when I saw that is, well, that's where you're going to have isobaric mixing between the moisture and less moist air, and maybe creating fresh condensate just from that isobaric mixing process. Is that still considered, or is that a possible additional mechanism for creating super cool water at the margins of clouds? Well, I, I think that I think that the concept I had at the time when I put that in there was that the initial condensation almost always goes into the water phase and then through the ice phase. But it, uh, you know, in, in, as, as it enters the cloud. Uh, so that's kind of a different process than what we're talking about up at the top. I don't think it's isobaric mis mixing because the air is moving along so fast, typically. That, you know, I mean, it's orographic flow, so the air, is, it turns into a cloud that's gone. Yeah, so, yeah. John. Yeah, really interesting, Bob. Great talk. Um, I asked you what I asked you this morning. What's the role of the synoptic scale of vertical motion causing? Because um, the whole talk yeah. makes yeah. it sound as if snow can fall in storms without any differentiation between strongly or weakly forced synoptic yeah. scale. Uh, the synoptic scale vertical motion does two things. One, it makes a cloud in the first place. Okay. So that <laughs> okay. gives you the boiling yeah. plate. Okay, right. if you don't have a cloud, you can't get cloud top generating. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it makes a cloud in the first place. The second thing it does is it, it provides moisture for continued growth of the ice below the generating cell level. Now, how does the vertical motion do that? Isn't the vertical, the vertical motion is slowly, I mean, if air is rising, you have adiabatic cooling. Adiabatic yep. cooling is continually increasing the vapor, uh, in, in, increasing the relative humidity. So what happens, okay? Yeah, yeah but the, not the vapor content. That's what I guess not, I'm confused about, so you can help me understand this better. Uh, that's, it, it's not changing the vapor content. Right. But it's but it's taking the relative humidity up above the relative humidity with respect to ice. Okay, so things can start to happen to it. Yeah. yeah. So it's got to go somewhere, okay. right? And, and and there is more vapor coming in, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's always a flux of vapor coming in. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So 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 it's 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 cause, it's it's allowing the ice crystals to grow as they come down. Now, you see, the reflectivity increases as you go down. That means yeah. the particles are getting bigger. Yeah. Okay. But the ice particle concentrations that we measured weren't getting higher. Okay, the particles were getting bigger. Yeah. So all the vapor is, and, and the air stays very close to ice saturation in that area. Okay, so as soon as you push it up above, push it up above ice saturation, uh, the ice particles grow a little more. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, and then they come down and, now there are some areas where, you know, like for example, if there's flow over a hill or something, you might get some rhyming that occurs in there. We didn't see much super cool water below cloud top in this, anywhere we flew. I mean, there's no icing whatsoever on the airplane ever, except the cloud top. That's what, that's what I think, yeah. But there's an interesting question that comes out of this, John. That's, if this is where all the snow's coming from, why do we have bands? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay? 3D deprivation. Okay. And I, yeah, I and, 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 and my, in my infinite wisdom of knowing how to push this off onto someone else, I gave my new PhD student that very problem. I said, go figure that out. 
So uh, I'll be up in five years and tell you what happened. <laughs> yeah. Have you looked at all in at the cloud top generating cells in the tropics in stratiform clouds and mesoscale convective systems? Or? No, and I'd love to, okay, but I have no data. Uh, so I did, there's a, a good question is whether they're at the top of yeah. MCSs in, yeah. in the mid latitudes at night. Mm -hmm. um, I think they probably are, but but you know the problem is I can't get anybody that wants to fly over top of them. Yeah. Uh, so it's they're hard. The hard problem with the with tropical clouds, of course, is they're very deep. It's very hard to get planes on top of them because they, they you know, yeah. they have ceilings that they can't fly above and stuff. This cloud, this plane probably could. You get up to fifty thousand feet. We flew here at forty-two thousand. The big, I should mention, the big problem with the nor the flying nor'easters is this traffic, right? Yeah. And so we, uh, you know, I, I I wanted to fly a straight line so we could put these model simulations on top of it. So I told him, I said, just, I said, go up above everybody. So we, we requested 42,000 feet. We got above all the commercial traffic. We could go straight. But, uh, but that's, but the problem is you can't fly down in those clouds without running into every, you know, all the, all the traffic. And so they, they, they start vectoring you everywhere and you don't get the data you want. Another question, Greg. How does aerosol chemistry figure into this? Because well, I mean, the nucleation parameterization is based on kind of an assumption of the chemistry. Yeah, I think I, I would. I, I think the big unknown in what I'm showing here is ice nucleation and how it happens. I really have no idea, and I think I think we, I, you know, when when I showed this to people like Paul Demont, you know, he's like, you know, I mean, what's going on? And there's. We, 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 we really don't understand ice nucleation very well and how it works in things like this. You know, I mean, we just don't, we just don't know. I, I, the answer is I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's no other questions. I wanted to ask you one more. You've got, you're starting to build up a nice uh, collection of observations slash model simulations that show you how intense your unstable layer is in terms of, you know, yeah. D theta, EBZ. Is there any relationship between the intensity, the instability, and the spacing of the generating cells? I, uh, that's another good question. Yeah. I, 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 I don't have. I really don't have enough data to probably quantify that. Okay. You know, I mean, it was hard to even even get a good Fourier analysis of, of the spacing of the generating cells. Mm -hmm. There's just not enough. You know, not enough. You're only up there for a short time, and, and you know, the, the problem is we didn't really understand what we were doing until we <coughs> got back and looked at all the data. Yeah. And you know, if I'd fly it again, I would fly it very differently to get in there even more. But, you know. Yeah, John. Just getting back to Sam's kind of idea about looking at other scales with his question. Um, what about Mamata's um, clouds and animals? Are these somehow related to the physics that you're talking about? Uh, I, I, don't, well, I, I don't don't think so. Okay, uh, there's, a, there's a nice paper out on Mamata's clouds that I uh, looked at so long ago that I can't remember anything in it. But uh, but it was uh, but but I, I think Dave Schultz might have written that. I'm not sure. Yeah, and uh, the uh, but but my understanding of Lamatus is really what you're looking at is evaporative cooling at the at the base of the cloud. I mean you've got all these particles falling into a drier layer at the base of the anvil, uh, and that you know I mean you're, you're basically it's latent cooling, and then the thing just collapses because of the cool air, and you get these you know blobs of cloud that, that extend down. That's a, that's what, that, that, that you now understand as much as I do about Lamatus clouds. <laughs> it sort of it sort of minimizes the possibility that supercooled water is cutting the hole. I, I dot it in those clouds, uh, in, in in the, the anvils of MCSs. I, there's been no no hint of that that I'm aware of. But you know, uh, there really is. There really, I mean, those are just blow-offs of the of the convection of, of all the ice particles. So. Uh, and, unless it, you know, at night at the top, I don't know. Maybe that's true, but those things are pretty high too. So you would be way above minus 40 probably. Uh, so if, if you see super cool water up there, you get a Nobel Prize because all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're, all the thermodynamics that go out the window when you're colder than minus 40. So, but uh, I haven't got that Nobel Prize yet. I'm hoping that you know, if I get up there and see that, maybe, you know, I still hope, you know. So anyway, other questions. Okay, well, let's thank you.